Hello, good evening. Welcome to this one day UVA virtual talk series. My name is Susan Lynch. I'm the Associate Director of Lifetime Learning at the University of Virginia's Office of Engagement. We are fortunate to have Suzanne Muma, the Director of the University of Virginia Press. She will introduce us to the UVA Press and to Mike Aleman, our main speaker this evening. Micah will respond to most questions after his talk. Lifetime Learning received several questions in advance of this program. If those questions are not answered in the course of Micah's presentation, we'll get to them during the Q&A. If you have questions during the event, please enter them in the chat box below. Please add your name and your UVA affiliation to your question. We are so happy you joined us this evening. Please enjoy this virtual one day UVA program. Please take it away, Suzanne. Thank you, Susan. It's nice to be with all of you. And I'm here representing the 18, my 18 colleagues uh, at UVA Press. Um, our press is almost 60 years old. And during that time, we've published almost 1,900 books from authors across the world, actually, uh, on, a, on an array of, of subjects. The UVA Press has a strong print list, but we also have a standard setting a digital imprint called, as you won't be surprised, Rotunda. So we have sort of been uh, pushing the boundaries for most of our 60 years. But the, the real question that uh, has come to me since I became director is what does UVA Press really do? Uh, there have been a couple of, of particularly interesting questions. We've had uh, calls from reporters from all over the country uh, responding to some uh, event on the UVA campus, thinking we're the press office. We've had um, people who call us who think we're UVA printing. But my personal favorite is the, the call I got asking if we printed telephone books. Now, Hooven remembers telephone books, but we don't do any of that. Um, the response is really simple. Uh, UVA Press, through its books, advances scholarship in history, in politics, in humanities, biography, architecture, and culture. We want UVA books to teach and inspire, but we also want them to have a larger reach of regional culture and interest. We want our books to gain understanding. We want our books to measure, be able to measure ourselves against the past. And probably as important, we want books to help us rewrite our collective script. So why Michael, uh, Michael Lebon and why Bible? That's part of our regional uh, outreach um, imprint. And as we began to think about all the things that people in central Virginia and beyond might be most interested in, uh, craft cocktails came to the top of the list. Um, Micah's craft and the production of this book put a stamp not just on terrific cocktails, but on the creation of an experience. I would argue that this is a cultural experience. His approach to cocktails and the spirits and ingredients within has taken us on this journey from ice making to um, homemade bitters. Uh, his cocktails have names, they have flavors, that remind us of times gone by, times of the future, television programs, people we like and love, but most important, they remind us of culture and cuisine from Central Virginia and far, far beyond. Now about Micah. He was born in Richmond, but he grew up in Tidewater. Uh, after college and majoring in biology, I might say, he decided that biomedical research was really not for him. So he, he got a job in bartending on the downtown mall and that job led to a passion at the Alley Light Bar where he has created a tone for cocktails in conversation that really uh, has spanned the United States and beyond. He's dedicated to the experience of the cocktail hour or the cocktail 30 minutes or the cocktail 15 minutes, depending on what, um, what the time period might be. But beyond that, to local ingredients, creative mixing, but pushing the boundary of flavor and ambience in place. 
as he says, it's, it's like attending a party with conversation about a range of different topics. Now, inside the flap of the book jacket is written, a good cocktail is never a random concoction. I could say the same about a good book. In this case, we get both great cocktails and a great book. But tonight, I want to highlight two attributes of the book that I think are particularly important. The first is that until the end of June, UVA Press is offering this book at 30% off. That's important to know. And the second thing is you can try this book at home, and we hope you will. With that, let me introduce Michael Lamont. Uh, hey, how's it going, everybody? Uh, thanks for joining this call tonight. Uh, hoping we get to learn how to make cocktails. Uh, and and I, I, I was telling uh, the folks who organized the call here uh, that professionally, drunk people interrupt me in my work. So if you guys have questions, uh, put them in the box and we'll, we'll try to get to them. Um, so let's, let's get started. Uh, so uh, cocktails. Today we're going to do a Cocktail 100. It's uh, just a seminar where we're going to do a crash course, uh, a little bit in history, uh, theory, technique. I'm going to introduce you guys to two basic cocktails and uh, hopefully at the end of this uh, presentation, you should have a little better insight into to how to make a good cocktail at home. Um, so just a little bit about me. So I work at the Alley Light. I run the bar program there. Um, uh, for those of you guys who don't live in Charlottesville, uh, the Alley Light is a, oops, uh, is a, uh, a cocktail bar that uh, we feature classic American cocktails, old world wines, and kind of elevated French small plates. Uh, so my job there is to make all the cocktails, make sure all my, my colleagues know how to make all the cocktails. So a big part of my job is educating people and uh, teaching them how to think about uh, cocktails. And so that's really uh, my book in a nutshell and what we're going to try to do here uh, tonight. Uh, so just, uh, just a little bit about my background. Uh, so I grew up and if you guys, if I ask you yes, no questions, and if you know the answer or don't know the answer, if you just go like that or like that or like that, then I'll help me uh, modify how much I go into detail about this, that, and the other tonight. Uh, okay, so, so I grew up uh, in, a, in a Pentecostal household. Uh, both, my, both my parents came from prominent Pentecostal families, and there was not a drop of alcohol to be found in, in our house or anybody else's house in, in our church. Um, so I didn't get exposure to, to alcohol until I was almost done with college. I got a, a random job at a country club uh, with a couple of buddies of mine and we were just mostly goofing off and bussing tables. And from time to time, uh, we had banquets at the club and uh, people would, um, uh, you know, come and, and need drinks. And so they repurposed uh, all of us as these skillless busboys into bartenders. So, uh, and, and we just thought that this was just the most bizarre experience because, you know, we, we opened all these bottles, we smelled the stuff, it smelled gross and disgusting. All these people lined up to drink all this stuff. They seemed to be having such a good time. And we just couldn't understand, you know, what this whole culture was and how any of this fire water could possibly be, be yummy. So that, that kind of formed a, a question for me, is, which is, you know, how do you render spirits that are so potent into cocktails that are balanced and delicious? And uh, I think I sent Susan uh, the, the notes that I'm talking off of, if you guys have those, you're welcome to follow along or just listen to me or, or tune me out as, as you like. Uh, so how do you, how do you make a, a cocktail with something that's, that's so powerful? So when I first started asking this question, uh, there wasn't a real good body of, of, uh, of literature and the internet was still young and 
so I, I really had to do a lot of trial and answer to try to answer this question. Uh, fortunately, while I was working on how to answer this question, some other folks were asking the same, same question. Um, so big names in, in cocktail books, uh, Dave Wondrick, Dave Arnold, Jeffrey Morgan Thaler. If any of this uh, cocktail history uh, excites you, I'd recommend uh, reading this book first, Imbibe, uh, uh, after you read uh, my book, The Imbibe. Uh, so, so these guys are doing some research, um, but I really had to, to kind of answer this question uh, myself. Um, so I, I made a lot of really bad cocktails uh, and, I, and I learned a lot. Uh, and fortunately, uh, as I was really starting to get serious into to making cocktails, uh, I came across Dave, uh, Dave Wondrick's book, uh, which has a really interesting uh, description of the story of, of where, where we get the cocktail from. So interestingly enough, the cocktail is, is an American invention. Um, and uh, it, it comes from a period just after the Revolutionary War where Americans were over imbibing quite heavily. Uh, they were drinking distillates. Uh, does, does anybody, do you guys know the difference between ferments and distillates? Uh, not, no, okay, great, perfect. So, uh, so ferments are things like beer, wine, and cider. Uh, so you, that's, a, that's a, a natural process where basically any sugary liquid uh, is going to be exposed to ambient yeast or inoculated with specific yeast and that's going to trigger uh, the yeast to chomp on fermentable sugars and kind of poop out CO2 and ethanol, alcohol. Uh, distillation is a process where you take that heterogeneous mixture of ethanol and water and you heat it up. And in the process of doing so, the more volatile thing, uh, more volatile vapor is going to come off of that liquid. You can catch, condense, and separate that liquid. The most volatile of those two is ethanol. So the vapors that you're catching uh, off the still is what you're, you're going to turn into your, your whiskey or what have you. So uh, something that's kind of interesting uh, to me is uh, uh, in the early days of, of the, the Republic, um, we, we had a lot of roots. I mean, obviously the, the colonies were English colonies. There was a lot of English culture that came with uh, the colonies. And, and one of them was drinking a lot. Uh, there was a big culture of drinking. And, you know, this is, this is kind of funny to think about, you know, if you're sick and you go to the doctor, you know, a Revolutionary War era doctor might ask you, well, are you drinking enough? Uh, alcohol was considered part of, of uh, a healthy life, especially drinking fermented beverages. You have a problem, though, when you replace fermented beverages with distilled beverages because distilled beverages are on the order of 10 to 30 times more potent than uh, fermented beverages. Uh, so we have a problem in the early 1800s with uh, Americans over imbibing. Specifically, they are drinking this very Spartan beverage, which is uh, sugar, whiskey, and water. And it's called slang, and people are throwing back slang, and alcoholism is a problem. Uh, being hungover is a problem, and, and interestingly enough, uh, well, what do you guys do if you make the mistake of over-imbibing? Probably have a little hair of the dog, maybe Bloody Mary, maybe, a, you know, some kind of, you know, beverage that's going to make your headache go away. So the colonial uh, people did the same thing. Uh, they would take the hair of the dog, their sling, and they would add some medicine to it the Alka-Seltzer of the day in the form of medicinal bitters. And uh, soon we've got a, uh-oh, uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, okay, great. Soon we've got a beverage uh, of whiskey, sugar, and bitters, which is essentially an old fashioned. And we start seeing the early movements of, of a cocktail uh, culture forming in the United States in the early 1800s. And uh, there's a generation of bartenders that are born in the 1800s that really take this and run with it. Uh, they incorporate this British tradition of punch, which itself was taken from India in the 1500s and 1600s. 
if that really floats your boat, there's another book uh, I can recommend to you. It's really fascinating. And uh, Americans really create a cocktail culture from about 1850 to 1920. And uh, I, I think that this is kind of an interesting point. Um, you know, when the cocktail is a quintessentially American thing, and Americans are always looking at something and saying, how can I make that better? How can I innovate it? How can I put my own spin on it? And, and I think that, that the cocktail really kind of encapsulates, you know, that kind of American sensibility that we have. And, you know, when you go to France and see old guys drinking cognac, they're just drinking cognac. They're not trying to do anything crazy with it. Uh, and it just shows, you know, when Americans see something, they're like, hmm, what could I do with that? And I think that the, the cocktail really uh, uh, exemplifies that. So uh, let's 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 not get too bogged down in cocktail history. Let's let's uh, talk about balanced cocktails. So one of the things I noticed when I looked at cocktails that seem to to survive the test of time, they all had three necessary components. Uh, they had a spirit base. Uh, they were sweetened with something uh, pretty sweet, usually some kind of sugar or sugar syrup. And then they were balanced with a. Uh, a balancing component, something either assertively sour or bitter. And uh, those three uh, components really form the core of, of successful cocktails. Uh, so a couple of you guys had asked me some questions, which I thought would be Im important to address uh, right now. Uh, someone had asked if I could make a tequila cocktail with no sugar. Um, well, you notice that our three necessary components for a balanced cocktail, our spirit, sweet, and then a balancing component of sour bitter. So you need sugar to balance your cocktail. Um, it, you know, uh, it's like someone asking me, how do I avoid death and taxes? How do I live forever? Uh, is, you can't do it. Uh, if you make a cocktail without sugar, your cocktail is going to be either overly acidic and boozy or overly bitter and boozy. And if that's how you like it, that's great, that's fine, that's how I'll make it for you. But if you're asking me to make you a balanced taste of cocktail, and put a little sugar in there. Uh, notice also if you're making a mocktail, um, if we've got spirit, sweet, sour, bitter, we take away spirit, uh, because obviously that's got alcohol. Our only way to get uh, bitterness into a cocktail is through alcoholic ingredients. So we're really left with sweet and sour, we're making a lemonade of sorts. Um, uh, this is next to impossible if we eliminate sugar from a mocktail. So when when people ask me to make mocktails with no sugar, it, it, it you know I I might as well you know shoot them off to the moon while I'm at it. Uh, it's difficult if not impossible. Um, so when you're making a, making a cocktail, just remember you need your three uh, balanced components or three, three necessary components. So also we need to make sure our, our uh, ingredients are properly proportioned. So that's why I had you guys get a little measuring cup or jigger. Um, this is the one I like to use here. It's, uh, it's got ounces on one side, tablespoons on the other. Uh, we're we're going to be looking at ounces tonight. Uh, and then we have to, once we've got all of our components present, uh, once they're properly proportioned, we have to, we have to technically execute them uh, with, with one of our two main techniques, uh, either shaking or stirring. So uh, when I first started bartending, I kind of thought that stirring was kind of dumb. I thought shaking was kind of dumb too, uh, until I had a, a really good stirred cocktail and a really good shaken cocktail. And uh, the, the best way to kind of analogize these, uh, these techniques, do you guys like to cook? I see some of you in your kitchen, do you like cooking? Yes, like cooking, <laughs> yes, okay, you like cooking, great. Uh, so when you're cooking, you're really adding heat and or more specifically denaturing proteins. But uh, when you're adding heat, you know, how you do it really matters. So if you think about, you've got a hamburger and you want to cook it, you know, if you put it on a ripping grill, you're going to get some good sear marks on it. You get some good sear marks on the other side, or you could just drop it in a pot of boiling water 
It's going to cook through in both, both cases, but you're going to be able to impart some specific uh, qualities to the final product uh, with how you add the heat. So it's kind of the same thing with cocktails. We're adding specific qualities in removing heat. So when we shake a cocktail with ice versus when we stir a cocktail with ice, we get two pretty different uh, cocktails. So, uh, so now that I've, I've talked for a long time, uh, let's, let's make a cocktail so you guys can, can enjoy yourself here. So uh, before we start, why don't you guys take just a moment and ice down your glassware that was on your little uh, equipment list. Uh, I had mentioned maybe have a cocktail coupe and a cocktail tumbler. We're gonna put our daiquiri in a coupe and our Sazerac in a tumbler. So let's just put some ice in our glass here real quick. Okay, got our cocktail glass chilling down here. Okay, and the reason why we, we chill it down is uh, is because we're gonna go to some pretty great lengths to, to specifically chill and dilute our cocktail. And we wanna make sure that once we do all that work, we don't put it in a hot glass or you know, some glass that's gonna you know, absorb some of the, the coldness and change the final temperature of the cocktail. So, um, so you notice um, when you're ch chilling your glassware here that um, you're gonna start to see um, two things happening. Uh, you're going to start to see water kind of forming in your glass, uh, indicating that there's an exchange of, of heat or coldness between your cubes and your, and your uh, uh, coupe. So why is that important? Well, because uh, the degree to which the cubes chill your coupe uh, has an impact in how much dilution water comes off of that. And so that's relevant to our, our two uh, techniques, shaking and stirring. When we shake a cocktail, we really get a much more violent interaction with our, our cocktail and our ice. Uh, consequently, we're going to get uh, more chilling and more dilution as opposed to stirring. And also when we shake a cocktail, uh, we're going to get a lot of aeration, which is, uh, for me, one of the biggest uh, differences between something like a, a, a daiquiri and a Sazerac. Uh, a daiquiri's got a bright aerated mouthfeel and a Sazerac, when it's properly made, has got a real heavy, silky mouthfeel. Uh, so uh, when, when do you shake, when do you stir? You shake a cocktail when you have juice. That's, that's the rule of thumb. Uh, more specifically, you shake a cocktail uh, when you've got you know, any thicker pulpy particulate ingredients uh, that need to be emulsified uh, when you want that aerated mouthfeel, and then uh, when you want your cocktail uh, chilled and diluted more. Uh, so um, I consider myself very fortunate that I think the year that we opened the Alley Light, uh, a cocktail science book came out called Liquid Intelligence, which I would highly recommend. Uh, because it has the data in it that really kind of codifies why you should do things a certain way in a cocktail bar. So when you shake a cocktail, and, and most of uh, the stuff, uh, that the way that we do things uh, and the way that most cocktail bars do things comes from the data that this guy uh, got over the course of 10 years of being fascinated with cocktails and having an unlimited budget to do whatever he wanted at the French Culinary Institute in New York. Uh, it's a really fascinating book. But anyways, uh, he was curious to see how long you should shake your cocktail and uh, what, what the final temperature would be. So he took a, uh, you know, a bunch of people shaking cocktails, looked at an axis of, uh, let's see here, uh, uh, temperature over time. And uh, as people shook their cocktails, looked at kind of the lower formation of that uh, uh, curve and kind of looked at when the best time to cut the time was. So you really wanna shake your cocktail for about 12 to 15 seconds. Uh, if we're doing our job correctly at the alley light, you'll notice that that's, that's how we do it. Uh, the target final temperature for a shaking cocktail 
uh, can be as low as 19 degrees Fahrenheit or negative five degrees Celsius. Uh, that is interesting to me because if you're uh, doing any math at home, you realize that we have ice that's at 32 degrees Fahrenheit and we add liquids that are either refrigerated or at room temperature and somehow we get a magical uh, sub-zero uh, resulting solution. Uh, and that has to do with uh, the thermodynamics of, of ethanol and alcohol solutions near 32 degrees Fahrenheit, which is really interesting. And we could talk about that in discussion if you want to. No one ever does, but we can if you want. Uh, so shake, let's, let's make shake a cocktail. Okay, so we've got our daiquiri. And I really like using the daiquiri as uh, the most uh, basic cocktail to teach folks to understand uh, uh, shaken cocktails. It's very simple. It's rum, lime, and sugar. And uh, once you master this cocktail, you can really kind of repurpose it however you want to make your own original cocktail. Uh, the thing I have in my book to kind of help people make their own original cocktails is this technique called the Mr. Potato Head technique. And so that's just substituting like ingredient for like ingredient and chances are you're gonna land uh, in a balanced cocktail that's probably tasty, if not a classic. Uh, so let's make our, our, uh, our daiquiri here. So we've got two ounces of aged rum. I got my rum here behind me. Uh, I'm gonna use Pusser's rum. I really like this stuff. It's yummy, it's not too expensive. Um, and we're gonna use our measuring cup here. Again, just make sure you're looking at, uh, at ounces there uh, and not tablespoons. So we're gonna do two ounces of rum. And this is our, our spirit portion of our cocktail here. Okay. Two ounces of rum and shaker. Now notice that we are adding our ingredients to our shaker without ice. We want to add ice at the end because we want to uniformly chill and dilute our cocktail, not sequentially and differentially chill and dilute our ingredients. Okay, so this forms our spirit base. About two ounces of spirit is about where most cocktails have uh, kind of land with their, their alcohol content. And, and by spirit, I mean uh, things like rum, gin, whiskey, whatever, usually around 40% alcohol or, or 80 proof. Okay, so that's our spirit base. Uh, we need to sweeten it. We're gonna sweeten it with a little bit of simple syrup, which was on your prep list, so hopefully you, you made that already. Okay, we're gonna do a half ounce of simple syrup. Okay, and then we need a balancing component. So for most shaken cocktails, we rely on the balancing component sour. And so our candidates for use as sour ingredients are where we live, lemon and lime juice. Uh, if we lived in the tropics, we could use key limes, uh, calamondins, uh, sour oranges, yuzus, uh, uh, Meyer lemons, any host of very tart acidic uh, citrus fruits, but but where, where we live, the, the most economical thing for us to use is lemon and lime juice. Uh, and you might be thinking to yourself, could I use grapefruit or orange juice? No. They are not sufficiently acidic enough to balance the sugar and alcohol in a cocktail. And you really need something that is assertively acidic to glue those two ingredients together. So let's, uh, let's grab our lime juice here. Uh, we're going to use a half ounce. Okay. Alrighty. So the next thing we're going to do is uh, put some ice in our shaker. We're going to fill it up to right about here. Okay. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to take this guy right here, this little lid. I'm going to pop it on here. And I'm gonna shake it for about 12 to 15 seconds. Once that's done, uh, because of, you remember from physics class, uh, we chill a volume of liquid and air 
uh, it's going to occupy uh, less volume. So you're going to have a vacuum between your shaker uh, top and your bottom. You're going to hit it with the butt of your hand, and then we're going to double strain our cocktail. So let's shake this here for, uh, for 12, 15 Mississippi here. Great. So we're going to double strain this into our cocktail glass here. Look at the aeration. And we're gonna garnish it here with just a little lime uh, wheel if you got one. Okay. And let's let's taste it, make sure it doesn't suck. Mm. Uh, so what do you guys what do you guys think about the daiquiri? Good stuff? Yeah, so this is a great recipe for you to just kind of master riff on. Uh, you'll notice that um, if you if you substitute um, just about any spirit in for rum, you, you've probably landed on a, a, a famous cocktail. Substitute gin in, you got a gimlet, vodka, you got a vodka gimlet, tequila, you're pretty close to a margarita. Uh, bourbon, you're getting close to a, a whiskey sour, uh, which brings me to one of your questions. Uh, one of you guys had asked, what is a good whiskey sour recipe without sour mix? And also, how to make sure that your egg whites don't poison anybody? Uh, good question. So, whiskey sour. Um, so, a sour mix is a uh, you know, it's, it's a sad thing. And as Americans, we we're good at innovating, but sometimes we cut corners because of capitalism and bottom lines. And I think sour mix is one of those things uh, where, you know, uh, you notice with our daiquiri, we essentially made sour mix a la minute. So we made some simple syrup. We made some lime juice. We have this uh, mix that yields a really fresh and tasty cocktail. Uh, the alternative to that is a, a bottled product that's made with high fructose corn syrup and a synthetically produced citric acid, which technically speaking is sweet and is sour, but it is a shadow of uh, what it could be if you used uh, fresh juice and just regular sugar. So um, I would advocate never using sour mix in, in fancy cocktails. Make it all a minute. Uh, you guys know how to do that now. Uh, you will hopefully feel that your cocktails are 100 times better uh, having juiced uh, citrus fresh instead of using sour mix. Um, so, oh, and, and how to make sure you don't poison anybody with egg whites. Okay, so uh, knock on wood. In six years of making people egg white cocktails at the alley light, uh, I've not poisoned anybody yet. And how I do that is I make sure my eggs don't have any poop on them, uh, which, you know, that obviously you want them not to have poop on them. Uh, wash your hands, uh, separate your eggs within a reasonable uh, proximity temporally to when you're going to make your cocktails. So for us, we separate them at the beginning of our shift. Uh, at the end of the shift, we give them to chef. She makes meringue out of them uh, or whatever. Uh, but use fresh eggs. Don't use eggs with poop on them. Wash your hands. Don't get stressed out. Um, you're going to be fine. Yeah. And I've got a, a whiskey sour recipe in those lecture notes that I sent you guys. Uh, very similar to our daiquiri recipe two ounces of bourbon, two ounces of spirit, uh, about the same amount of, uh, of, of citrus juice, three quarters of an ounce of lemon, three quarters of an ounce of simple syrup. 
and half of an ounce of egg white. Uh, egg white cocktails, just real quickly, are, are really, really yummy. Uh, you do need to, to shake them with, with some elbow grease. Uh, so to, to shake them sufficiently without over diluting them, we uh, dry shake them without ice, then we wet shake them with ice, and then you can garnish your uh, cocktail in any number of ways you would like to. So uh, speaking of, of shaking here, you may have noticed a uh, fun thing. Uh, you see how we've got icy stuff forming on the outside of our, our shaker, uh, uh, bearing witness to uh, things being sub-zero. Uh, also, uh, we, we double strain this because, uh, I don't know if you can see that, That's, that was a couple of minutes ago. We still have some chippy bits in our, our, our tea strainer, and these are, they just kind of screw up our cocktail a little bit because our cocktail after 15 seconds is perfect, right? It's perfectly chilled and diluted. Uh, these guys, because of the high uh, surface area to low volume ratio, are going to slough more water into our cocktail and dilute it without sufficiently doing anything for our chilling component. So you just want to take it out of the, out of the equation and just get rid of it. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so I thought um, uh, uh, if the moderator wanted to take a couple questions right now, we could, we could do that. Or if you guys want to plow on and, and, and have some more drinks, we can do that. Um, uh, I don't see any any more questions in the chat box, but anybody okay. wants to add some in. So no questions right now. Okay, great. Uh, alrighty. So let's move on to spare cocktails. So, and, and I'll give you guys just a moment because I don't know if you have a large quantity of, of shakers uh, at your house. We'll need to give our shaker a, a rinse here and our, our measuring cup of rinse uh, before we, we make our next cocktail. So let's do that real quick. So uh, we're going to make a, a stirred cocktail next. So in my book, um, I use the Manhattan as kind of the, the basic cocktail that you want to master, uh, to master stirred cocktails. For this seminar, I thought that we would do a Sazerac um, for a couple reasons. Uh, my recipe for a Manhattan, uh, which was what one of you guys asked, I, I can give that to you now, uh, two ounces of bullet rye, one ounce of Carpano Antica sweet vermouth, uh, it's uh, Italian vermouth, and four drops of Bob's Abbott's Bitters. Bob's is the brand, Abbott's is the style, and it's a cocktail bitters. Uh, and that's a stirred cocktail. You put it in a coupe with a, a brandy cherry. Uh, the reason why I didn't include that tonight was uh, Bob's Abbott's Bitters is, is hard to find. It's also expensive. It's one of the most expensive ingredients we have per ounce behind the bar. Uh, it is about $45 for about three ounces, um, which might sound uh, outrageous, but when you taste it, you understand why it's so expensive. It's, it's un unbelievably delicious. Uh, and the Carpano Antica sweet vermouth can be a little harder to find. It's also a little more expensive uh, but it is well worth it. That cocktail is an investment of a hundred bucks just to have one. So I thought we'd just do a, a, a Sazerac, uh, it, especially while we're in the middle of a global viral pandemic. This is not very kind to make you run over all over God's green earth to, to find uh, fancy cocktail ingredients. Uh, so we're going to talk about um, the Sazerac as our stirred cocktail. So, um, Stirred cocktails in contrast to shaking cocktails. Um, why do we stir a cocktail? Uh, essentially, we stir cocktails, the rule of thumb is when we don't have any juice. Uh, and more specifically, 
so, so those would be cocktails like the Manhattan, the Martini, the Negroni, uh, the Bonsoni, um, and, and all of its cousins, the Martinez. Uh, essentially cocktails that are mostly like spirits and vermouth and bittersweet cordials. Um, so we, we stir cocktails more specifically when we don't want them to be aerated. When instead of a bright mouthfeel, we want a silky, heavy one. Uh, and then we want our cocktail chilled less and diluted less. So stirred cocktails, um, so we mentioned shaken cocktails kind of rely on the balancing ingredient uh, sour. Everybody's familiar with lemon and limes. Uh, stirred cocktails rely on bitter ingredients. And so when I first started bartending, people would say, you know, cocktail bitters. And I'd be like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> What's in cocktail bitters? And they'd be like, oh, it's, it's bitter stuff. And like, like what? Uh, wormwood, gentian, cinchona. And, you know, you'd be hard pressed to go to any grocery store in the United States and, and find any of those ingredients. Uh, so to, to get a better idea of what those are, uh, you know, I purchased them online, uh, I've, and then I've, I've grown some. So uh, I'm gonna show you some, uh, some famous bitter uh, plants that feature prominently in the cocktails that actually we're gonna have. Uh, so this is, uh, this is wormwood. Uh, it's really beautiful. This is what's used to flavor absinthe and to bitter absinthe. Um, this does not make you hallucinate. That's an old wives' tale uh, peddled by uh, uh, winemakers who were losing money to the popularity of absinthe in the 17 and 1800s. Um, these little flowers on here are, are used to, they're really fragrant, they're really yummy, they're very bitter, uh, and they're used both to bitter absinthe and vermouth in our Manhattan that we mentioned. Um, your two other famous uh, bittering ingredients are gentian and cinchona. And those are barks, or those are roots and barks respectively, which are not that exciting to look at. Uh, but I brought some other fun plants for us to look at. Uh, this is burdock. This is another famous bittering ingredient. Uh, and this is uh, an artichoke leaf. And uh, uh, I'm representing UVA here, because uh, this, uh, this guy and this guy are both from Monticello. Uh, yeah. Alrighty. So let's make a Sazerac. So the Sazerac is, uh, so we mentioned at the beginning of the lecture about how um, people were drinking this cocktail called Sling, how that kind of turned into an old fashioned. And so in the early part of the, uh, the 1800s, people were essentially drinking this concoction of brown spirit, sugar, and cocktail bitters. And that's essentially what a Sazerac is. It is a, uh, and a regional riff on an old fashioned uh, from New Orleans. So uh, in your ingredient list, you may notice that I had said, hey, you can make this with either cognac or, or uh, rye whiskey. Uh, did you guys do brandy? Or did you do, or did you do rye? Oh, we've got a lot of rise. Okay, great. So the reason why it's made with either one of those um, is, is kind of interesting. So uh, New Orleans uh, used to be part of France. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, founder of the University of Virginia, uh, acquired uh, uh, that part of our country in the Louisiana Purchase. And so uh, prior to American influence there, there was a lot of French influence. And so people were drinking Sazeracs with, with French distillates, uh, specifically cognac, which is a specific type of brandy. Brandy, it's a, a grape distillate. Um, so what happened was, uh, you know, in the latter part of the 1800s, uh, we have two things happening. Uh, we have the emergence of whiskey as a respected distillate. Uh, prior to that, people kind of thought that whiskey was like a low-class beverage. Um, uh, thinking about the English roots of, of, of the colonies. Uh, it's really interesting. In England, people from England at that time were very much uh, 
what's the word, uh, xenophiles. They, they liked foreign stuff. So um, my, my wife and I are watching the, the masterpiece theater show Poldark uh, right now, which is set like right after the end of the uh, Revolutionary War in England. And I think it's really interesting. All of the beverages that they drink are very much demonstrative of their, their xenophilia. They want to drink Caribbean rum. They want to drink French wine. They want to drink sherry from Spain. They want to drink port from Portugal. Um, so, so anyhow, uh, whiskey was kind of a, a low-class distillate for much of uh, the early kind of cocktail uh, movement in the 1800s uh, until uh, there is a little tiny bug that called phylloxera that decimates all of the root stocks of grapevines in Europe. And uh, brandy becomes globally scarce. And in the American cocktail scene, that leads to uh, whiskey replacing a lot of cocktails that previously had brandy. So that's why you can make it either way. I like the brandy version just a little bit better. Um, but enough pontificating, let's, let's make a cocktail here. Okay, so we're going to make, I'm gonna make mine with brandy again. Um, and we're gonna do a short two ounces of, of brandy or rye. Um, I, I've got a little bit of a sweet tooth, so I like to dial down the booze just a little bit. So it's just a little sweeter. If, if you don't like your cocktail super sweet, which uh, the lady with the tequila question about the zero sugar cocktail, uh, you probably want two ounces. Uh, that's totally okay. I'm gonna put one and three quarters ounce of uh, a brandy in mine. So let's let's do that. Okay. Okay. So this forms our spirit base of our necessary components. Uh, we need to sweeten our cocktail. We're gonna do that the same way as we did with our daiquiri. Uh, we're going to do a half ounce of uh, simple syrup. Okay. Notice again that we're doing this the same way we did the daiquiri. We're building it. We're going to ice it at the end. Okay. And then come our bittering ingredients. So, uh, in our Manhattan, we've got an ounce of sweet vermouth. And sweet vermouth gives us... Uh, Two bangs for our buck. It's sweet and it's bitter. So it's it's able to balance the, the rye whiskey in a Manhattan. We add the cocktail bitters just for a little hint of uh, additional flavor. Uh, with our Sazerac, uh, we're going to achieve the same thing with some simple syrup and some cocktail bitters. So the, uh, the cocktail bitters that is famous uh, with the Sazerac is Peychaud's. Um, this is not my favorite bitters. I think it is better when used in conjunction with uh, Angostura. So uh, people, you know, some purists like to do five dashes, seven dashes of this. I like to do three dashes of this and two dashes of this. And so when you do a dash, you really want to Uh, and the reason why you do that instead of just kind of going like that is we're taking great pains to uniformly measure everything and properly proportion things. So we want to make sure our dashes actually are all uniform here. So I'm going to show you how to do a dash here. Okay. Do two dashes of Angostura here. Okay, now we're going to rinse our glass with absinthe. Uh, and the reason why we do a rinse instead of just adding it right uh, in the shaker, we could do like a, a bar spoon if we wanted to, or we could just rinse it. That's going to help us uh, control the amount of absinthe that we get. So um, you see that absinthe is uh, very potent alcoholically. It's 55%. It's also face meltingly bitter. So if you put too much of this stuff, it's gonna overpower your cocktail. That's why we do a rinse instead of adding a bunch in our shaker here. So let's rinse our, our cocktail glass. Okay. 
Okay, so just gonna put a tiny little guy in here. Okay. Okay, now we're gonna ice down our cocktail here. Just my our shaker. Alrighty, and now we're gonna stir our cocktail. So uh, when you stir your cocktail, what you really just wanna do is skim the ice in your shaker here. What you want to avoid doing is doing this because you don't want to aerate uh, your cocktail. You just want to spin the cubes in the liquid so you get that nice heavy uh, mouthfeel here. So, and we're gonna we're gonna oops, we're going to stir this for about 30 seconds, and uh, we'll talk about the math there in a second here. So. Uh, this takes a long time to do it right. And I like to feel my, my cocktail glass to get a feel of when it's done. I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about it right now. Okay. So we are going to strain this out into our cocktail glass here. Okay, next thing we're going to do is we're going to uh, garnish this with a, a lemon twist. So I'm going to walk you through that. So you're going to take your peeler and your lemon. You're going to take a slice from the top to the bottom, like so. Uh, at this point, we have a piece of lemon. Uh, this is the outside. This is the pith side. This is the side where all the oil is. We want to shoot that oil into our glass so that we get all that yummy, yummy flavor in it. So I'm going to show you how to do that. You just kind of little rim, a little twist, drop it in there. Okay, make sure this doesn't suck. Great. I think I'm going to enjoy this one. Um, okay, so uh, just a little bit about our, our technique. Um, so stirred cocktails, we mentioned um, that they get less chilling in dilution. And so the target final temperature for a, a stirred cocktail is warmer than a shaken cocktail. So you get less chilling, less dilution. And if you look at that graph of, of uh, uh, temperature over time, you get a little plateau, uh, lower plateau of about 30 seconds. And that's gonna land your cocktail right at uh, the freezing point of water, right around 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so, great. And at the end of your, your lecture notes, um, I've got just a page with those recipes uh, in case uh, uh, you'd like to have those for ready reference next time uh, you have folks over for cocktails. They're also printed in my cocktail book, The End Bible. Uh, okay, so hopefully, great, we've got a little time for some, some Q&A here. So does, uh, I'm going to turn turn it back over to, to Susan to to vet questions and sure we have a we have some my way so uh, one of the first questions was um, could we explore the whole 19 degree Fahrenheit Fahrenheit thing whoa seriously yeah they're curious okay. why that happens oh uh, okay so um, so this is it's I'm gonna see if I can get this right because it's very complicated um, and there's a link in the lecture notes to a blog post that discusses this uh, a, a little more 
uh, in, in depth. Um, so so it, is, it is a war between entropy and enthalpy. So enthalpy is the amount of heat present in a system and all things being equal, uh, heat wants to leave a system and go to a lower energy state. So that means in the context of our cocktail that uh, we would prefer to have uh, ice remaining ice instead of getting warmer and diluting. Entropy is a measure of disorder in a system. And for all of you people whose eyes are glazed over, I'm going to be done with this in about 45 seconds, so just bear with me. <laughs> Entropy is a measure of disorder in a system. All things being equal, a system wants to have more disorder, more chaos, go from a, a, a more orderly to a less orderly configuration in the system. Uh, this is complicated because uh, in alcohol, water solutions near the freezing point of water, water is able to achieve more entropy by diluting than by being ice. So it's pushing the, the other way from enthalpy. Uh, and so who wins, enthalpy or entropy? Uh, uh, and, and the reason why, bear with me, the reason why you get more chaos with ice, ice melting is because you have more microstates available to water. And instead of being locked in a crystalline matrix that's frozen, it can go and do more chaotic things. So essentially the, the equation favors the dilution of ice. And we know the chilling and dilution are inextricably intertwined. So if we have more dilution, we have more chilling. So that's how we get below the freezing point of water. Okay. The, did that, how, did that make sense to anyone? If I see a single thumb, <laughs> I, will, I will make, yes! Yeah. Okay. okay. All right, so there's a question about cubed or crushed ice. Um, do you always use cubed? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so uh, it depends. So if you remember when we, uh, when we shook that cocktail and we double strained off uh, the little chippy bits. I mentioned that um, the crushed ice, the little chippies, have a, a large surface area relative to the volume inside of them. So uh, crushed ice is going to uh, over dilute your cocktail more than a larger piece of ice. Um, so, uh, so this is this is a, a an axe that. A lot of people grind with with uh, cocktail bars that have the the chip ice that's made with the inexpensive ice machine as, as opposed to a hoshizaki or a, or a cold draft which are fancy brands of, of ice cubes that make the larger cubes so uh you know it, crushed ice might be exactly what you want if you're making a tiki cocktail or if you're making a mint julep or you're making some kind of you know sherry cobbler uh, but if you're making a, a, a stirred cocktail or shaken cocktail, you want to have uh, some degree of, of cubed ice that is going to, you know, be okay with yielding the, the optimal uh, chilling and dilution. So, um, yeah, hopefully that answers your, your question there. Okay. Um, so what's the relationship between uh, Sasserac, the drink, the bar in New Orleans and the Spirits Company. Oh, I, I think it has to do. Uh, so I think Sazerac. Uh, uh, this is all. So um, a, a lot of this is legend and lore. Um, uh, from what I understand, Peshad was a pharmacist, and he he made this you know medicinal bitters, which we talked about in the intro. How people drank medicinal bitters to for their health. Um, so, so that's the bitters end, and then I understand that that Sazerac is either uh, a, a a brand or a a guy or both, and and that's kind of the marketing story of it. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, any tips for using flavored vodkas or rums, or should we just avoid those? Uh, oh, man. Um, okay. Uh, which would you prefer in your life? Resorting to artifice or resorting <laughs> to truth? <laughs> I, re I try to make things as true and flavorful as possible without resorting to artifice. Uh, flavored vodka has artificial flavors. And so do a lot of other flavored rums and, and, uh, and whiskeys. Uh, which is not to say that, you know, they don't have their place and that they're not delicious in, in a certain context. Um, you know, I, I don't hate Malibu rum, like, in, in the right context. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, I try to, uh, at least in my work, I try to build all of the flavor uh, from scratch instead of uh, getting an ingredient that, that is artificially flavored. So I, I hope that's not too disappointing, but... I, I don't have a whole lot of experience uh, contemporarily mixing with flavored vodkas. Okay, great. Um, so how long does a simple syrup batch last? Um, so you want to keep it in the fridge um, and it probably lasts you a good couple of months if you, you do. I, I made this uh, batch uh, for a class I did uh, in early May and it was, it was fine. Um, yeah, just keep it in your fridge and yeah, should look up the last couple months. Okay. So what is your favorite drink to make at the Alley Light? Oh, Sazerac. <laughs> uh, so, so this is one of my favorites. So, uh, so a, a cocktail like a Sazerac or a Daiquiri, I feel like is a pretty good window into uh, both both the skill of the bartender that whose bar you're at and and also where their palate skews so um you know th there these are cocktails that that are more than just the sum of their parts when they're properly proportioned and they're made with technical uh, uh ex expertise technical proficiency uh they're really really yummy uh when they're not made well they they're just either too boozy, too sweet, too acidic, just kind of limp. Um, but when they're made, when they're made correctly, they're really, really yummy. Um, <laughs> so, so that, so that's kind of like, you know, there are lots of crazy things that, that I do at the alley light that I would, I would never in a million years go to somebody else's bar and, and ask them to, to do that just cause it's, I, I do some stuff that's a real big pain. Um, so I, I try not to foist any of my opinions on, on anybody or, yeah. But uh, if we were open right now, uh, I would be very, <laughs> very, very pumped up about uh, uh, peaches and making bourbon peach sours. Uh, that's a cocktail that's in my book. Um, you know, this time of year, the, the peaches that you can get from, from Carter Mountain and Childs are just so mind-blowingly yummy. And even if you get ones that are a little underripe, you can ripen them on your counter. And they're so perfect with bourbon and, and a little lemon and egg white macerating with sugar. Yeah, if, if, if we were open right now, uh, that would be the special. And you guys would be loving them. I hope. So, uh, so yeah, that's my answer there. Okay, hopefully soon, hopefully soon. So why is rye preferred to bourbon for many cocktails? Well, can you repeat that? What's why is rye why is... preferred to bourbon for many cocktails? Oh, um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so there's a couple of things. Uh, there's some history there. Um, so suburban, I talked about how some of the distillates were kind of stigmatized during that era of, of uh, the 1800s. Um, so rye was one of the first whiskeys that kind of like was popular. So uh, in bourbon, you don't really have a tradition of making bourbon 
until after the whiskey rebellion. So, um, and, and if there are any historians in the, the audience, uh, bear with my uh, grasp of the historical ins and outs of the whiskey rebellion. But essentially, uh, the New Republic was broke. Alexander Hamilton said, hey, why don't we tax whiskey? Because that's what everybody was using as currency. Uh, Americans didn't like this idea. Uh, so all of the people that were making whiskey were mostly Scots-Irish people uh, near kind of the Blue Ridge, Shenandoah, and then and in parts of Pennsylvania. And when uh, Alexander Hamilton decided to, you know, marshal the resources of the federal government and round up all these guys, a lot of them fled into Kentucky. Uh, and then they started making uh, bourbon there. That's why bourbon is called bourbon is because it's made in Kentucky. Um, so I would probably say that that rye precedes uh, bourbon specifically and, and as such is a better candidate for replacing things like brandy and cocktails when that becomes scarce. Uh, also, um, the more that I make Manhattans, uh, the more that I'm convinced that, that rye is correct. It's, it's not as sweet as bourbon. Uh, the bread, rye and bourbon can, there, there's definitely some overlap, but rye is a little more bready and spicy. Bourbon's a little more like kind of sweet, caramelly. And I just think that uh, for certain cocktails, it just makes more sense to use uh, uh, rye specifically with vermouth. Um, and that's, that's why you see things like, uh, uh, you know, the Remember the Maine, the, the, the Manhattan, the, uh, the, uh, the De La Louisiane, and all of these other riffs of, uh, of the Manhattan being made with, with rye instead of bourbon. So a little history, a little preference. Uh, that's my answer. Okay. <laughs> uh, does rye have to come from Indiana like bourbon has to come from Kentucky? Oh, wow, this is fun. Uh, <laughs> so it's funny that you should mention Indiana, uh, because the, the rye that you got probably came from, you might be looking at bullet rye. Um, uh, so there's a dirty little secret, which I'll tell you about, uh, <laughs> Americans, we're entrepreneurs. We want to start businesses. What do you do when you got an idea for a whiskey distillery? but it takes four years to make your first batch of whiskey. And, and that's before you, I mean, you've got to build out your, your distillery. You've got to get a million dollar bond that the federal government approves. You've got to jump through all these. It's going to take you six years before you actually sell a drop of your own booze. What do you do? You buy whiskey from a giant factory in Indiana, and then you sell it under your own label. Uh, and you're able to do this uh, because there's a little thing at the bottom that says, you know, distill the bottle or whatever in, in Lawrenceville, Indiana. There is a, a giant factory called MGP, Midway, Midwestern Grain Processors, that makes a lot of the whiskey that uh, is on the shelves. And I have to say that they're a giant factory that makes really good whiskey. It's, it's very okay. Um, uh, but uh, it, it is not, it's maybe a little dishonest for people to not really understand that if whiskey comes from factory and not from, you know, the bullet family. But uh, from what I understand, that's just kind of a business model that most distilleries kind of ultimately phase out those things while they're able to make their own thing. So rye is rye because it mostly has, it has 51% rye in the grain bill uh, and, uh, and, and a, usually some combination of three other grains, corn, wheat, uh, and barley. Usually it always has some amount of barley because of course barley contains diastatic enzymes which enable fermentation. Um, and then bourbon is kind of the opposite where it's 51% corn and then some degree of those other three grains that I mentioned. But it usually always has some some amount of barley in it. It can be made anywhere in the United States, provided that those grain bills are met for rye and bourbon and that they are aged in American charred oak containers. And that's 
that's all you need. So you can, you can make it in Puerto Rico if you want, um, but you just have to follow those rules. Uh, okay, next question. Okay. Well, I think we're going to see if we can find out from everybody which cocktail was their favorite. So uh, maybe everybody can put their thumbs up for which one. We can go with cocktail number one. Oh, A couple okay. people for that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then how about cocktail number two? Ah, there we go. There we go. Nice. <laughs> okay. Cool. Yeah, you're all Micah's people. <laughs> all right, great. Any more questions from everybody? Doesn't look like it. Okay. All right. Uh, well, let me say it is a pleasure uh, spending the evening with you guys, and I hope that you will go forth and bring joy and, and tranquility and harmony to your corners of the world with your knowledge of, of balanced cocktails. Thanks for having me tonight. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Getting lots of applause. Lots of applause. Great. So thank you so much, uh, Micah and um, Suzanne, for being with us, and to all of you for taking time out of your evening for this event. Uh, Lifetime Learning has some raffle prizes this evening. So we will be sending a copy of Micah's book to two lucky participants and gift certificates to two participants to the Alley Light uh, where Micah is the bar manager. So hopefully when you go in, Micah will be working. Um, raffle winners will receive an email from me in the next day or two. Our next one day UVA virtual event will be on Thursday, July 16th will be joined by UVA's Scott DeVoe, as, who is a groundbreaking jazz historian, and UVA's John DeEarth, a jazz performer and a teacher for a late afternoon discussion of history and music. So please keep your eye out for that event. So in the meantime, please stay safe and be well and enjoy the rest of your evening and thank you so much. Cheers. <laughs>